You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney, and Snarky Faith is radio for the spiritually disenfranchised. If you've had enough of the insanity in Christianity, you've come to the right place. Here at Snarky Faith, we're all about finding a sane faith grounded in reality and working to make the world a better place. If you can handle your conversations about faith with copious amounts of sarcasm and also a bit of this, then welcome home. We're glad to have you here. On today's show, we are going to be taking a little bit of a road trip. Yep, that's right. We're taking a literal road trip for our main discussion today. I'll explain it more later, but before we descend into this snark, just a reminder that this broadcast and all past podcasts can be found at snarkyfaith.com and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Amazon, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, we're there, we're everywhere. Just look for Snarky Faith. And if you like the show, make sure to share, subscribe, and if you're feeling generous, drop a review over on Apple Podcasts, too. It helps to get the word out to new Well, welcome to the show. I hope everyone's week is treating them well thus far. I hope you're doing well out there in the world. As for me, here in Chapel Hill and Carborough, it is beginning to feel a bit like summer. Yes. It (laughs) we I, I think that there is a thing called like the 70s that we somehow just skipped along the way. We kind of went from like high 60s to 80s and now 90s. How you doing, neighbor? How you doing? Yeah, yeah. But, but, let me begin the show by telling you this. We, I took the show off last week because I had to drive down and pick up my kids from college. I had to go pick up my two oldest kids as they had finished the year in college and road trip and drive them back home, which is why the main part of our conversation today is going to be my journey on that road trip. It's going to be a taste of the show on the road. I'll explain more as we continue to go on, but there's been so much for us to talk about with another racially motivated, yeah, I'll call that racially motivated mass shooting that happened in Buffalo. That is another tragedy that somehow America is cool with. It's very cool with it because we have a problem here with guns, but we don't want to do anything about it. And we also don't want to do anything about racism here in the country. But, but, taking precedence from what was lost, let's go ahead and we are going to jump right into the news because what I want to do is spend a little bit of time today at the beginning of our show talking about reproductive rights. So without further ado, let's hop in to our news section. In the news. In the news. So reproductive rights, Roe v. Wade, abortion access, it's all back in the news after the Supreme Court leaked documents came out, which which I will mention, I find some of this absolutely adorable. Now, only like adorable in the sense of uh, Clarence Thomas, who had the audacity to come out and say that, that the leak had like shaken the public trust in the institution. Yeah, buddy, yeah, that's, mm, mmm, mmm. But calling the kettle Jenny Thomas, insurrectionist wife, anyone, 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 any perspective there, Justice Thomas? Nope, nope. Yeah, I didn't expect anything else from you. So what I want to do is I want to hop in with all that's going on, and we're going to do a bit of the Christian crazy mixed into here, mixed into our in the news category as we begin to talk about this. And I want to talk about this based upon first what the mouthpieces of conservatism are saying about this topic. Then what I hope to do is descend into what does scripture actually say about this complicated topic. 
And I am well aware that this is a very complex and complicated topic that somehow Americans have boiled down into a very binary system of just being able to say, I'm for this, I'm against this. And I even made the mistake years ago, I was facilitating a group that uh, we were, it, it was it was a group to just be able to talk about different issues in the news, and in this in this group that we were we were having, we ended up having somebody that was very very much pro choice and some someone that was very 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 much pro life, and they began to just hash it out. They began to hash it out, and I made the mistake in my youth of many years ago of being able to say, hold on, hold on, hold on. This issue is 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 not simply about being anti-abortion and pro-abortion, pro which at that moment they both turned on me because I was not speaking about this in the right regard. And this is a very complicated issue, but it's really not. It's really not. But, but like I said, let's begin. Let's begin by hearing what some of the conservative mouthpieces are saying about this. First off, come on. First off, we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene and her take her, mm, what do you want to say, interesting take on things? So, hey, hey, give it to us, Margie. Tell us exactly how the devil coaxes women into getting an abortion. Hmm. It's whispered softly and gently into your ears and into your soul. And he tells you it's okay. And he says it's just, just this one thing. You're just going to get it done, get it over with, and then he tells you a promise. He promises you all these dreams that, that you have in your heart. And that's how Satan sells a sin, and that's how he sells abortion. He tells a woman that all you have to do is you're just going to go to this clinic, just going to get it over with, you know. And then you're going to, that guy, he's going to stay with you, that, that boyfriend or the guy, whoever he is. He's going to marry you, sweep you off your feet. Is Satan a romantic here? He's like whispering softly, making you romantical promises. I don't know what this bit of horse shit that's coming out of her mouth actually means. Like, I, I don't even understand how she's trying to bring in theology and spirituality and whatever her weird wonky system is. But, but, but I get caught up in this because also like this last week, she has been complaining that there is a media narrative out there that is pushing this narrative that she is an unintelligent moron. Now, aw, Marge, Margie, come on, come on. You know it's not the media. It's just your mouth that does it. Yeah, it's your mouth. The thing that keeps moving, that's why we all think that you are an ab... So there, there's your conservative take on the fact that Satan just whispers sweet nothings. And women want men so bad, they buy into that delusion. <laughs> I don't really even know how to fully respond to this prattle that's going on here, but this one. Could it be Satan? S sounds about right. I think, yeah, that sounds about right. That checks out. So, yes, yeah, so it's Satan's fault. Now, let's move over to what some pastors are doing and how they are whipping up fervors within their congregations about this topic, about this topic of, of women having the right to choose and make decisions over their own bodies, right? So there's many pastors out there, and this is a beautiful example of it. It is a wonderful example here of pastors abjectly lying about things in order to be able to sell the emotions that surround this topic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See if you can spot, see if you can spot the moments where reality is left behind and all we have is fantasy. Thank you, yeah. Thank you, Pastor Jack Hibbs. Let me tell you Give something. Us your fan. The Democrat Party is a death cult. Every single Democrat voted to kill babies up in Sacramento last week out of the womb. Kill them. Kill them, they said. Kill them. And what's going to wake us up? Where's the pulpits? Where's the pastors? This is the last call. 
God is not going to put up with it anymore. If there was an ark being built, I could hear the doors, the hinges starting to creak as that door is beginning to shut. Quick point real here. Just want to add the fact that using the illustration of Noah's ark to be able to defend reproductive rights for women is kind of an interesting one here, especially coming from a person that would claim that they're pro-life. We're all about pro-life. So let me use this example about where God committed genocide in the Old Testament, where lots of babies were killed. Like, hypothetically, if this story was literally true, it's not. But if it was, that's kind of disgusting and a little off topic if you're trying to be pro-life. And mm, yeah, yeah. But guess what? It only gets better. It only gets better from here. Go, Jack. You go. can see clouds starting to form. I believe, friends, in the spirit, clouds are starting to form over the state of California. This is our last call. And woe, woe to the pulpit that does not get involved to save a child's life. Woe to the pulpit that stays silent at an hour like this. I mean, if we're going to get in on some of the woes, I'm going to kind of be like woe to the pastors and prophets and leaders that continue to sell bullshit to their congregations and make money off it. Woe to you. But also, like, just like a little note here. So he's trying to say that there's clouds forming in the spiritual realm over California. Hey, aren't you guys going through, like, a historic drought? Like, shouldn't this be good news? Like, whoa, there's clouds forming. We're going to get some rain here in California. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. Now this will get us real close to where I'm wanting to take us. Real, real close. But we still have one more example here before we hop into more scripture. Because, again... I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, using scripture to be able to back this issue is going to leave you a little bit scratching of the head because it's God's rule book. Why does it not specifically speak about this? Well, there's a lot God does speak of about this in the Old Testament, and I think we're going to have a little bit of fun with it. But, but before we hop to that, before we hop to that, I want to introduce to you, because again, most of what we're dealing with in this issue is, is going to be all about the fine wines of hypocrisy. Oh, drinking those fine wines of hypocrisy. Oh, can you taste the notes? Can, can you taste the notes of irony in this? Mmm, it has a wonderful, wonderful bouquet. So next in our sampling platter of folks that like to talk out both sides of their mouth, we have... Candidate for governor, candidate for governor in the state of Colorado, Greg Lopez. Now, he was being interviewed about his stances and what he believes in, but also had a little problem reconciling that with the past. And in the end, gives the stupidest response, the most cringy Christian response that you can when presented with allegations against yourself. Enjoy. You are pro-life without exceptions for rape and incest and life or health of the mother. Additionally, in 1993, you were arrested for violently assaulting your then pregnant wife. Some people might see those two things at odds, but they both involve you exerting control over a woman's body. Is that what Coloradans want from their governor? Well, first of all, it wasn't a violent situation. If you, like, you, know, if you go back and look- You were look arrested for assault. We were both arrested for assault, mm -hmm. both of us. And okay. one of you was pregnant. So again, the question so is, the, do Coloradans want somebody who has a history both in word and in physical let me tell you this, Kyle. of controlling the bodies of Here's women. the thing. There's only been one perfect man that's ever walked this earth, and we nailed him to the cross. There's only been one perfect man, and we nailed him to the cross. Oh, that's your answer? Oh, dear God. That was really stupid. No, I mean, I, I but, okay, first of all, you got to like the fact that he's got to push back on this guy's assumptions. Well... Well, it was like a gentle assault, and she did it too. 
Come on, come on, man. You know, you know, you know. Dude, dude, dude. Why, why do these people just continue to keep moving forward? Oh, it's because... It's because evangelicals and conservatives continue to allow them and they continue to applaud this kind of whatever this is. Yeah, yeah, worst dude for the job. Seems like a good choice for us, says the GOP. But this, this, this whole issue, this, this lightning rod issue that we have has a long history, has a long history here in the United States. And before we get to what I would like to refer to as historical context, let's, let's dig deep into the ancient historical context. So we're going to hop into some Bible verses. And yet, I want to remind you how the folks... See, I looked this one up just for you guys, right? This is from Crosswalk.com. Good Christians! Good Christians! And this, was, uh, it, this is in one of these dumb lists they have by Scott Kusendorf. Uh, Ten things you should know about abortion. And what I really appreciated what Scott Dusseldorf or whatever uh, Dorfy said here, uh, he had his point six. And I love the logic that he's somehow using in scriptures to tell us why abortion is bad. Okay? Okay. So he's going to have four points and a conclusion. Okay? Just follow this with me. Number one, his first point. In the Great Commission... Christ charged the church to go make disciples. Okay, that's true. I get it. Okay, Jesus did. Is point number two. The way we make disciples is to, quote, teach them to obey his commands. Eh, I mean, I'm a little iffy on that statement. But I would really more to say as part of the idea of making disciples is teaching them to view the world in the way that Christ did and then go and do. This teach and obey stuff, I, I don't know. But again, okay, he's, he, he, he's, he's building to something here. Point three. One of those commands is that we are not to shed innocent blood. Now, he's referring to the Ten Commandments where it says thou shalt not kill, okay? Point four. Abortion is the shedding of innocent blood. Now, he took a leap here because this also is not biblical. So then his conclusion, therefore, preaching on abortion relates to the Great Commission responsibilities of the local church. Okay, so we're supposed to go out and reach people with the message of Jesus, yes, and tell them to do what we think we want them to do, and, 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 I, the Great Commission has nothing to do with this, even though I know there are Christians out there like, the best way to fill our Christian nation here is with Christian babies! Christian babies! Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's an incredibly flawed logic, what we have going here. Okay, so if you, actually, if you actually want to get into this issue, now, I want to lay out this ahead of time, that this is a complicated issue. This is not a binary pro or against issue, because in how we are talking about this in public discourse, usually involves the fact that we're both talking about, like, when you see the sides on this issue, and there's, there's multifaceted sides, it's not just pro and, and against, but, but that the majority of the issue that people have with the Supreme Court and the government at large is the fact, does the government have the right to legislate what women can and can't do with their bodies, right? Okay. So that's that's that that is that is the main issue that is being argued in the courts and in the governances around the United States. Now, the emotional issue, the emotional issue people bring up is it's an issue of morality. Well, the issue of whether it is moral or amoral is secondary. The main issue is does the government have the right to do that? Now that gets lost in this. Now with the secondary issue that we throw up. Is it moral? Is it not moral? The Bible tells us not to kill. Sure, I will give you that. In the Ten Commandments, Moses lays out the idea that thou shalt not kill. And we all know that, oh, the Ten Commandments, yes, yes, that's kind of what God wanted for his people. Sure, sure, sure. But honestly, like to, to use that, as, as your main point in this argument, is kind of silly. 
let's just kind of think about how did Moses and the Israelites get out of Egypt? Like, what was the plague that broke the Pharaoh's back? I think I do believe the story goes about the children of Israel needing to put blood in their doorways so a death angel would pass them over and not kill their firstborn son. That's interesting. So you can basically surmise in that story that God killed children and babies. Still, 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 still. We're not talking about a woman's right to choose. But again, let's just continue on on, on, on the way that God continues to show us through the Old Testament. Because again, that's not how we're supposed to use Scripture. But I'm going to use Scripture in the way that they like to use Scripture. Can I get where I'm going with this? Okay. So next, this is a fun one. I'm going to just skim through this one. But this is a delightful one. This comes from Numbers 5. And we're going to be skimming through verses 11 through 21. Okay? So here's how this goes. Love it. So this is how an, unf an unfaithful wife or a supposed or accused unfaithful wife is supposed to be dealt with, okay? Starting in 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man's wife goes astray and is unfaithful to him so that another man has sexual relations with her and this is hidden from her husband and her impurity is undetected because, parentheses, since there was no witness against her and since she has not been caught in the act, that's a whole different story. End parentheses. 14. And if feelings of jealousy come over the husband and he suspects his wife and she is impure, or if he is jealous and suspects her even though she is not impure, then he's supposed to take his wife to a priest. Here's where it gets fun. Okay. We're going to hop down to 16. So the priest brings, shall bring her and have her stand before the Lord. Then he shall take some holy water in a clay jar, put some dust from the tabernacle floor into the water. After the priest has had the woman stand before the Lord, he shall loosen her hair and place in her hands the reminder offering, the grain offering for her jealousy, while he himself holds the bitter water that brings curse. Then the priest shall put the woman under an oath and say to her, if no man has had sexual relations with you and you have not gone astray and become impure while married to your husband, may this bitter water that brings a curse not harm you. But if you've gone astray while married to your husband and you have made yourself impure by having sexual relations with a man other than your husband, then you're the priest. Here the priest is to put the woman under a curse. Ooh. Quote, may the Lord cause you to become a curse amongst your people when he makes your womb miscarry and your abdomen swell. So wait, were the priests handing out the Holy Spirit's elixir of plan B here? I don't know. I don't know. It's a little dubious. It's a little dubious. Let's hop over to 1 Samuel 15.3. Oh, this is a fun one. This is what the Lord's saying. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Heartwarming. Why doesn't someone put that on a pillow? Psalm 137, 8 through 9. Daughter Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Mm, just, just warms the heart. Just warms the heart. But if you actually really want to kind of dig into what would be more of the Old Testament philosophy of how they viewed a, a baby or even a pre-baby, a zygote embryo in the womb. Oh, 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 don't worry. Moses has got you covered, boys and girls. He's got you covered. All right, this is Exodus 21, 22 through 25. Now, get this. If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands in the court allows. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. Oof, oof. It's lovely. 
It's lovely. So this is a great example of why we don't really proof text the Bible. Because those situations were had a historical context to them. They were for a place and a time. And in many ways, it could be people getting stuff wrong. <laughs> oh, we want to go kill those guys. I'm pretty sure God hates them too. Sweet. Let's go kill them. God's on our side. That kind of an idea. But if you do, if you do want to engage the Bible, like logically on, on a topic like this, the the accurate way I would say to be able to descend upon this topic would be to see how much God how much God values personal choice. Think about that. Think about that, biblically speaking. That God doesn't come and make us do things. That 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 is a huge, that is a huge theological concept. The idea of freedom of choice. Because in the Bible, humanity ends up being depicted as a complex, multifaceted creature with the ability and responsibility to make decisions and choices and live with the consequences. The concept of free will is kind of a big deal in the Bible. So if you want to go hunting and pecking around for scriptures that are pro-life or pro-choice, eh, God seems to be pretty pro-choice in regards to humanity. <laughs> now, if you want to understand the real origins of the religious right, you should check out the article, The Real Origins of the Religious Right, on politico.com. I'll attach it. I'll attach it. But I'll attach it to the show notes. But what I want to do is I'm going to give you somebody that essentially summarizes up for you. Yeah, and it's way better. Now, this is Pastor Paul from over on TikTok. And Pastor Paul is going to give us the rundown that we need to hear about how Christianity found itself in a position such as this. Did you know that American Protestants and evangelicals have not always been anti-abortion extremists? Now, it's a fairly new development. Roe v. Wade was handed down by the Supreme Court in 1973, but into the late 70s, the Southern Baptist Conference, the biggest evangelical Protestant denomination in the world, still had not come out strongly anti-abortion. And some in the Baptist Convention even believed of affirming Roe v. Wade and wanted government funding for abortion for the poor. That's where this guy came in, Jerry Falwell Sr. He was very angry at Jimmy Carter's administration for forcing his college, Liberty College, to integrate, as well as many other private Christian schools. Falwell partnered with a Republican operative named Paul Weyrich and began to hatch a plan to use abortion to manipulate Christian voters to get Jimmy Carter out of office. Despite the fact that Jimmy Carter is probably the most Christian and evangelical president we've ever had. So Falwell and the Republican operatives birthed the moral majority, and this guy, one of the most liberal pro-abortion governors in history, suddenly became staunchly anti-abortion and Christian. And that person he's referencing is Ronald Reagan. And it worked. The moral majority got Carter out of office, put Reagan in, and today abortion is a weaponized issue that manipulates Christian voters to this day. Republicans still laugh behind closed doors. We can just say abortion, and Christians will vote any way we tell them to vote. This despite the fact that the Bible is almost completely agnostic on the issue of abortion, and our Jewish friends, whose religion is the foundation of our beliefs, are almost universally pro-choice, including the nation of Israel, which has legalized abortion, which the federal government pays for for its citizens. That's right, Christians, the country you idolize above all others, Israel, pays through the government funding for abortion. You see, abortion is a political issue, not a biblical one. And sadly, Falwell and Weyrich's strategy has worked, weaponizing abortion to where even the overthrow of our country is supported by Christians. And a minority party is trying to find a way to get and hold political power over our nation all due to a pastor that didn't want people of color coming into his university. And yes, sadly, once again, Christian political issues have deep roots in racism. Oof, that is a bitter pill to swallow, knowing that so much of the Christian legacy 
is rooted in that. So, I've mentioned before that this is a very complex issue. And I want to give a little bit of nuance, nuance handed to you by Adam Russell Taylor from Sojourners Magazine in his article, As a Christian, I Want to Reduce Abortion, Not Overturn Roe. So here is some nuance from Taylor. He says this, recent, recent polling from Pew Research Center found that most Americans hold a combination of views typically ascribed to the pro-choice and pro-life perspectives. Pew survey found that only 8% of U.S. adults believe in believe abortion should be illegal in all cases without exemptions. Similarly, only 19% of adults believe that abortion should be legal in all cases without exception. By contrast, 71% of those surveyed said they believed that there were in instances in which abortion should be legal and other instances where it shouldn't be legal. This aligns with earlier Pew findings and data showing that 70% of U.S. adults and 59% of U.S. Christians oppose Supreme Court overturning of Roe v. Wade. Thus, most Americans have a more nuanced position than the current debate implies. But the us-versus-them mindset and, and increasingly zero-sum nature of our politics doesn't have much use for complexity. Now, speaking of nuance, speaking of nuance, I also want to speak on how we should talk about this. What is a good way for us to talk about this? I've got a great example. I've got a great example from Pete Buttigieg speaking to a Fox News crowd in a way that I feel was nuanced, but also honest and made sense in a way that can actually help people. I think the, the dialogue has got so caught up on where you draw the line that we've gotten away from the fundamental question of who gets to draw the line? And I trust women to draw the line when it's their own. So, so just to be clear, just to be clear, you're saying that you would be okay with a woman well into the third trimester deciding to abort a pregnancy. Look, th these hypotheticals are usually set up in order to provoke a strong well, no, emotional... No, but Frank, in no, fairness, oh, sir, right, so it's not hypothetical. There are 6,000 women a year who get abortions in the third That's right, pregnancy. representing less than 1% of cases. I but know, but 6,000 pregnancies. Let's take ourselves in... Yeah. So let's put ourselves in the shoes of a woman in that situation. If it's that late in your pregnancy, that means almost by definition, you've been expecting to carry it to term. We're talking about women who have perhaps chosen a name, women who have purchased a crib, families that then get the most devastating medical news of their lifetime, something about the health or the life of the mother that forces them to make an impossible, unthinkable choice. And the bottom line is, uh, as horrible as that choice is, uh, uh, that woman, that family may seek uh, spiritual guidance, they may speak, seek medical guidance, but it's, that decision's not going to be made any better, medically or morally, because the government is dictating how that decision should be made. Yep, this is a very complicated issue, but at the heart of it, the answer is fairly simple. I'll give you the words of Keith Giles. You may not realize it, but there was a very successful pro-life movement that started in the 1860s. At that time, abortion was so commonplace that advertisements for abortion ran in the newspapers. The abortion rate adjusting for per capita statistics was as large as what America endured in post Roe v. Wade era. In the book Abortion in America by James Seymour, this time between 1840 and 1880 is referred to as the great upsurge of abortion. Estimates are that at least 20% of pregnancies were ended in induced abortion during that time in history. And another book, The Great Crime of the 19th Century by Edmund Hale, claimed that two-thirds of pregnancies during the mid to late 1800s ended in induced abortion. It was a dark time. However, by 1910, that abortion rate had been cut in half by a movement of Christians who provided women with positive alternatives to abortion. They focused on helping young pregnant women in poor communities, including prostitutes, carry their children full term. After delivery, they either helped each young mother find adoptive parents for her child, or they stood by her to help her keep the child. Those Christians truly focused on serving women in trouble, and they committed themselves to providing practical alternatives to abortion. They sought to transform society within 
one person at a time rather than laws alone. Based on this historical example, if our passion is to end abortion in our nation, the best way to do so is to circumvent the political process, which to date have not been proven very effective, and to love our neighbor as Jesus commanded. If we commit ourselves to sharing the love of Christ with those around us, we might just discover that Jesus was right all along about how to change the world for the better. That comes from Keith Giles's Jesus Untangled. And I personally have a similar story. Um, I recall this was many years ago when I was at a pastor's luncheon in the town that I lived in. One of the pastors from a local Presbyterian church was bragging about their outreach that they were doing to the local Planned Parenthood. So I inquired, what do you mean by outreach? And he's like, oh, we're there defending the unborn. And I held my breath because I didn't want to just launch into him at the time. But then I, I, pulled him, I pulled him to the side after the luncheon and just asked him. I was like, so I know what you're doing, and you think you're doing a good thing here by picketing and shaming women from going into this clinic. Now, have you ever thought, or has your church ever thought of being able to set up systems to be able to, like we were just reading from Keith Giles, like support these young women, take them in, uh, even offering to adopt these children? And the pastor just turned to me, and he goes, he kind of laughs a little bit. He's, yeah, he's like, that's just that that that's just too hard. That's just too hard. He literally said that. That's that that was just too hard. Which, which you got to love it when a person that is preaching the gospel or supposedly preaching the gospel essentially says the ethics and ways of Jesus are too hard. Instead, we just need to double down on anger and shame and hate. Because, hey, for a lot of Christianity in America, that's worked for a while. So, eh, 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 eh. But it does. It breaks my heart that this is a very, 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 very complicated issue. And we try to make it so simple. We try to make this something that is so easy and binary, whereas the, the group of folks that like to declare themselves as being pro-life, they're really just pro-potential life. Because then what begins to happen is the baby gets born. Oh, it's a drain on our system. So, like, why? Like, seriously, like, why don't the pro-life folks include, include feeding and giving health care to these children or, or these women? Why, why are we doing that? Well, just like that pastor told me, in the end, it's just too darn hard. It's just too hard. It's just too hard to walk out the ways of Jesus. Ugh. Ugh. I truly hate the way this conversation has evolved in America. But again, I will repeat this. At the end of the day, the primary conversation piece, the primary argument is over whether the government should have the right to tell women what they can and can't do with their bodies. Whether this is moral or amoral, that's a secondary issue. A secondary issue. So moving along to our main conversation, as we have been discussing over these past couple of weeks, we've been, we've been diving through what does it really look like as we're walking down this road of kind of spiritual formation and growth uh, we've been talking through books like Diogenes Allen's Spiritual Theology and The Gift of the Dark Woods by Aaron, Eric Elms. And I had mentioned earlier in the show that I had spent last week driving down to Georgia and all around <laughs> picking up my kids uh, from college. And so what I decided to do was to try to film some of the show in my car. And as things happen when you're on road trips, they don't always go the way they are planned. So in advance... In advance, I will go ahead and tell you the audio quality is not superb. Uh, it would be easy for me to blame the terrible interstate roads of South Carolina, which are atrocious. But really, but really, it this yeah. So here's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> I'll put the audio quality on me, but I did want to share with you guys this message that is connecting with where we've been at and where we've been going. So this, this is a conversation about life along the journey and on a road trip. 
Here you go. So I wanted to do something a little bit different this week, and I am currently on Highway 20 driving towards Atlanta to pick up my daughter from college. And we've been going through a series on the spiritual journey. We've been talking through the works of Diogenes Allen and Eric Elms. And in those conversations, it really got me thinking as I'm driving here about there's a difference between how we talk about journeys and actually going on them. It's one thing to prepare and plan and, and go through it in your head. It's another thing to actually put rubber on the road and begin to go. Meaning I had everything that I thought I needed prepped and ready for my trip, but as you start going down the highway, you adjust and you adapt. I've hit traffic, I've seen wrecks, and you adjust, you adapt, because you have a certain point in your mind of where you're going, right? Now, oftentimes, I can think back in my spiritual youth, so to speak, how much I used to be a destination-driven person. Like, it's always about getting there. In the past, if you were one of my kids or youth, if I was taking them on some sort of a missions trip or otherwise, or my family going on a family vacation, they've known that I can be very hard-nosed about trying to get somewhere fast, trying to get somewhere efficient, and trying to get somewhere on time. I remember as a kid, that was my dad's philosophy, was get up as early as you possibly can. It helped that he barely slept. So usually when I was a kid, we would be getting up like the crack of dawn, actually the pre-butt crack of dawn, meaning that we'd be leaving around 3.30 when we would go on trips. And one of the things I, I, I learned very quickly on was I liked doing that. I liked traveling in the dark because somehow once the sun popped up, you're like, wow, I'm in a different place now. But I mentioned that used to be my philosophy of just get there. And what I didn't realize along the way is that kind of a philosophy of just having a goal and driving towards it can in weird ways make you sort of Machiavellian. The end justifies the mean. Now, on our spiritual lives, when we're talking about things like faith and growth and growing, the process is the path. The process, what it takes, mile by mile, step by step, is the point. It is the point. It's how things are changing us moment to moment. Uh, my old way of doing things would be so focused on what is going to happen, what's going to happen in X number of hours, the presence, I could be downright hard to live with in the present. We did. This is a method I came up with when my children were younger called controlled dehydration. We would, I would make sure, you go to the bathroom before we start on the trip. No fluids, no fluids, unless you're about to die, because I did not want to take any stops. Because stops means loss of time. But, but, enjoying the road, enjoying the trip, enjoying the process was in the periphery of my mind. I just had to get to where I was going. And what I would end up doing is I would usually do it at the cost of myself and the cost of others. I remember we had done a, I don't think I could pull this off now, but it's been like at least 10 years ago. I remember taking a missions trip from Washington to LA, Washington State to LA. And we left on a Friday night. We stopped at a friend of mine's in Oregon and had our entire group crash there. And again, get you guys up at the crack of dawn. 3.30, 3.30. Uh, I roll these teenagers out and we continue to grind all the way until the evening and making it to Los Angeles. I think the toll on my body, the toll on my mental, my mental self, 
was immeasurable. I was exhausted. I don't remember a whole lot of it. I just remember I drove the entire time. And and I missed I missed the landscape as we were going through. I missed the conversations in the vehicle. I missed the music and sing-alongs because I was just so driven in where I needed to go. And and I think I think when it comes to faith, we can get very much caught up in those destination thinking, those that kind of conclusion thinking. I mean, with most of us, when we're brought to faith, it's this idea of certainty that we want Jesus because we don't want to go to hell. We don't want to die. We don't want any of that, right? So we already start the process knowing where the destination is. Well, when I die, I'm going to be floating in the clouds with angels and Jesus, right? And what ends up happening with that is, honestly, I think that we tend to forego life before that process. And if you're from the evangelical or uh, conservative persuasion, I think that gets even more morphed because we can oftentimes get obsessed with eschatology or end times beliefs, or that leaves us in places where we're just like, well, the here and now really doesn't matter. It's all gonna burn and go away. And so that changes, that profoundly changes our present reality, if we view it that way. Now, if I view everything as a process, how how does that change me? How does that change my posture? How does that change how I engage with those around me? It changes it quite a lot. If I am less, if I am less driven by the certainty and the outcome of situations, I am able to be more awake and aware of what is happening now in my present. I am able to be more awake and aware in my own skin. I am awake and aware more of those around me. And part of that that process of being able to perceive reality for what it is, and also seeing reality for what it's not, when we're able to do that, we're able to engage things with more of a posture of humility, one where we do not mind serving and helping others because we realize that we're unfinished products just like everyone else is. Instead of me getting angry at this other person or offended by somebody else, I put myself in their shoes a bit. And then I'm able to really kind of take a breath and engage with what is around me in a whole different light. It helps me to embrace the now. And I feel like that was one thing that Jesus was really hitting home with. Now in one of our past, one of our past series, we talked through the Sermon on the Mount and how that laid out really the ethics of the kingdom of God and what Jesus was all about and the imprint of what Jesus wanted his followers to be about. It was it was honing people's lenses to be able to see the world and all of us as unfinished business. Not broken, not un- unredeemable, but just as unfinished business. Just as I'm not fully formed and not done, the people around us are in the exact same boat. And me being able, me being able to get out of my head, get out of my goals, get out of all of those things that turn me into either like a robot or a monster that just keeps me pushing forward and grinding over anybody in my path to get my goal, when I'm able to seize that, I'm actually able to engage with life around me in a life-giving way, but in a way that really leans in to the process of, of my own growth it leans me in towards the process of other people's growth. Because 
one, one thing that just that, that gets me too about this, and it's it's on this on it's a tangent, but it's not. But our our obsession, I feel like our obsession with with the Bible and Scripture can also leave us in places where again we feel like we have everything figured out. How many times have you heard it? Oh, the only book I need is the Bible. It is my it is my guidebook to life. It tells me exactly what to do if I am encountering ancient Babylonians. It, <laughs> it may tell me exactly how I need to act during the Iron Age or the Bronze Age, I don't know. But but we see this this book as finished business. And in many ways, just like we want to see ourselves, like, oh, Christ has already done the work for me. Look at it. I'm finished business. But really, when I, when I read the Bible, I've begun to read it in a way and, and, and hold it lightly in a way that helps me to see the humanity, the human fingerprints all over the Bible. And the way I'm able to engage it is I'm able to see people that are also still in process, trying to experience God in that process, oftentimes getting wrong <laughs> where God's at in the process, just like us. And when we when we begin to see scripture like that, when we begin to see our, our path and our journey and our progress like that, you're able to see the fullness of life unfolding around us. Now, why is that important? Well, I think it's important for us to be seeing life as it is because that leads us into different spiritual practices. Like, for one, uh, gratitude. Gratitude is something that really can only be seen in the present. We need to be able to see what we're grateful for today. Not what I was grateful for yesterday, which is important in the yesterday, but today. What am I grateful for? What what are things that give me life? What are things where where do I see beauty? Where does that gratitude in my sphere in front of me reside? Because when we engage with a grateful heart, we see things differently as well. And so gratitude has been a huge thing for me. Another thing I've realized that keeps me grounded in the present is being able to stop. Just like on my trip, before I started doing this video, I had made a pit stop, uh, filled up gas, and it made all the difference in the world. Oh boy, try driving on a full bladder. That, that is one way to not live in the present, or maybe it's very present. <laughs> <laughs> when you're looking for an exit, looking for a place where I need to go. But much like having to pee on a road trip, it gives us tunnel vision. It gives us tunnel vision. And we're not able to see the things that are moving and engaging around us. Well, thank you for being a part of this complicated conversation this hour we've talked through everything for from pro life pro choice pro you pro being awake all these kind of things and and we definitely do live in a very complex world that deems it necessary it deems us necessary to stay awake and aware of what's happening around us and not getting caught up in all of the insanity that Christianity tries to dump on our doorstep. Now, many of you may be saying, but Stuart, I got no Christian crazy today. Was I not a good boy or girl? Why did I not get enough Christian crazy? Well, guess what? Guess what, boys and girls? You can have it. You just got to listen to it on podcast. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We finish this broadcast. You can catch the full shows on podcast at snarkyfaith.com or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Yes, that's just how it works. So as I release you into this wide, wide world, I send you out with the holiest amount of grace and peace and snark.
Telling you to show up in those spaces where you need to show up. Telling you to be that form of Jesus to people that need to experience Jesus. Let us be people that transcend easy answers and binary setups to questions. Let us be a people that are able to look at the world, see it as it is, realize our place in it, and also recognize that there is plenty of work to be done. Continue, continue to be your awesome selves. Continue to reach out to those in your areas and spheres of influence that need help. Show up, show out, and be as snarky as your badass lets you be. Because there's no limits to how far I'm letting you be snarky. Go and do and be in this crazy world. And I will catch you guys again next week. I'm out of here. Peace be with you. Hey there, I know you hung around till the end of the show, so I just have to tell you this. Don't tell the other listeners. Don't tell them. I'll deny this, but you're my favorite. Yeah, you, specifically you. You know who you are. You are my absolute favorite because you hung around till the end of this long show to get a taste of the choices cuts in Christian nuts. That's right. You said I can't. I can't go on a minute further unless I have my Christian crazy. So I would just, I would be evil in not giving you what you desire. So guess what, folks? Guess what? Here it is on a silver platter. Your Christian crazy of the week. If loving the Lord is wrong, I don't want to be right. Lord have mercy. The Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. So first up, this is only out there. This this is a shout out to only the Christian men of testicular fortitude out there. So yes, yes, you of the fallopian persuasion. Just plug your ears, because this is only patriarchy, baby. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I love you all. But this, this is a bit of insanity that comes from the Stronger, Stronger Men's Conference. So for those of you that want to learn how to be a stronger man, you missed that, but there's always next year, baby. There's always next year. Well, we just wrapped up the Stronger Men's Conference for 2022, and it was mind-blowingly good. I mean, we saw monster trucks, we saw bull riding, but more important than all of the fun we had was that we encountered the presence of God in a life-changing way through messages from powerful world-class communicators, Louis Giglio, Tim Timberlake, Chad Beach. It was so good. Now, though, it's time to turn our attention toward 2023, and all that God is gonna do in this arena next year. We're back. Craig Rochelle's gonna be with us. Earl McClellan, one of my favorite communicators on the planet, and US Senator Josh Hawley. You wanna register right now because this weekend you get the best rate possible. 40% off next year's on site rate can be yours today. So go ahead and register. The link is in the bio and we'll see you in 2023. That's right, baby. If you, if you are worried, if you are out there and you're a Christian man and you're white and you're worried about being replaced and you're racist, but don't want to really admit it, right? That kind of a thing. <laughs> the Stronger Men's Conference is for you because what better way to encounter God than through monster trucks and bull riding? 
accompanied with a bunch of pastors who have sold their soul for the almighty dollar. Get in now, because no one wants to miss Josh Hawley next year, right? Insurrectionist, unite! Stronger Men's Conference 2023. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful. Now, now next up, now next up, if you were worried, if you were worried that Trump is being forgotten, oh, that man of God, oh, the orange messiah, you've been worried about him. You're just worried he's down in Mar-a-Lago playing golf, but what about God? What's God going to do with this chosen anointed one? Oh, don't worry, folks. Johnny and Lowe's got a bunch of verbal diarrhea because you got to love it now that he's kind of found his thing. He's found his like little niche in the world and it's taking stupid stuff like sporting events or other things and trying to dissect them in a way that tells you what God is truly saying. Mm-hmm. Example, Kofefe. Aww. We all thought Trump had just somehow like, oh, was pushing a deuce out too hard and just didn't pay attention to autocorrect. But you would be wrong. You would be wrong, and you're probably going to hell because John Inlow is going to tell you what that really meant. Oh, baby, buckle up. Kofefe is C-O-V-F-E-F-E. And, and so that's how it's spelled, okay? C-O-V-F-E-F-E. Can't do it with the fingers when I'm doing like this. But anyway, Cove Fifi. And yes, people thought that was an error for spelling coffee. Like they haven't learned yet that President Trump doesn't really miss anything. If something <laughs> is spelled, if he leaves out an L, he adds an R, he does. It's everything has a reason and a purpose. This is very strategic what is taking place. So Cove is, um, it's, there are three from the table of elements. CO is for cobalt. V is for vanadium. Fe, Fe is two molecules of iron. This is the solution, the antidote to the 5G towers that were really designed to work with the vaccines and essentially hack really? the human beings. Really? And so what he implemented when he was telling Kofifi before, um, he was... So they created, I essentially, if I understand it correctly, some sort of magnet that they put at every pole, 5G pole, that essentially doesn't allow it to do the hacking that they wanted to do. Oh, genius. That man, oh, what a genius. Like, I love how Johnny Enlow is, is really, he is God's servant. He is just here to hold up a mirror to Donald Trump so we can all see the greatness of it. And I just love how someone finally had the uh, the strength, the fortitude to do this. He must have been to the Strong Men's Conference because no one else is going to say this because this is totally, totally batshit crazy. Huh? 5G medals? What is going on here? It doesn't matter because you said to yourself, that's probably the cringiest thing of the week and you were wrong. I'm not here to pamper you. I'm not here to tell you you're a good boy or girl. No, no, you are wrong. Here's the real Christian cringe of the week. Christian cringe. No, God, please, no, no. There are no words to describe what exorcist Bob Larson is going to say. And I will leave you with this. In the spirit of the train wreck that is the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. This will make so much more sense. It won't. There are such things as real pirate demons. I don't see them much in the mainland U.S. But when I'm in a coastal city, or when I'm ministering in the Caribbean, I see lots of pirate demons, and I've encountered them and cast them out. So this whole Jack Sparrow role, there's a bit of truth to that. And I wonder, did Depp get actual pirate demons from playing his Jack Sparrow role? You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. 
But you have heard of me. 